Welcome to the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Bootcamp. Today is Thursday, February 2nd, and this is our last session of the 2023 Vendor Bootcamp. Today we have Dr. David Lockwood with UT Extension. He is our fruit specialist, and he is going to be handling our topic today, which is post-harvest handling. Your job does not stop at harvest. My name is Rachel Painter, and I'm a value-added agriculture marketing extension specialist with the Center for Profitable Agriculture with UT Extension. This does help you qualify for the Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program. To receive a special requirement educational credit for the TAEP program, you will need to view five of the six one-hour sessions and complete the evaluation survey for each of those sessions by April 1st. So that means if you have watched all five or six of those sessions by now, you would need to have completed that survey five or six times. Again, uh, the survey link is in your email. If you are registered for this training, you will receive the email to take that survey. If you do not receive that email, please contact me. Again, this helps you qualify for the TAP program, which is a cost share program with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And this helps you in the following producer diversification sectors, agritourism, fruits and vegetables, and value added. For more information about TAEP, please contact TDA at producer.diversification at tn.gov. Again, I work with the Center for Profitable Agriculture, and we can help you in evaluating, planning, and developing your value-added enterprise. If you have questions about our upcoming programs or what we can offer, you can visit cpa.tennessee.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook at Value Added Ag, and we recently started an Instagram as well. Of course, you can also contact your local UTTSU extension agent. We have an extension agent in all 95 counties in the state of Tennessee, and you can find your local office and contact your local extension agent by visiting utextension.tennessee.edu. We also work closely with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. You can find more information about the TAEP program and other programs that they offer, including regulations, at tn.gov. You can also find the Pick Tennessee Products platform at picktnproducts.org, which is a free marketing platform that you have access to. You need to apply to be listed on the Pick Tennessee Products platform, and the application is on that website. We also work closely with the Tennessee Association of Farmers Markets, and you can find more information about the resources that they offer and the collaborations that they have at tnfarmersmarkets.org. Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. David Lockwood, again, our fruit specialist in plant sciences with UT. And his topic, again, is post-harvest handling. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Rachel said, we're, we're going to talk about post-harvest handling of fruits and vegetables. And your job does not stop at harvest. So with that, we'll get into it. Uh, found this in a publication I was reading. You can consider post-harvest storage as a hotel for your produce, not a hospital. And the idea is that uh, it's the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. That is quality after storage and proper ripening can never be better than harvest quality. Poor quality fruit placed in the storage will be poor quality fruit when you remove it. So we don't want to spend our, our time and our money putting something in that's gonna deteriorate more than uh, it should while we're waiting for, uh, for it to go to market. High quality produce results from sound practices before we harvest, during harvest, and after harvest. So we'll, we'll gloss over that, uh, those quickly and then look pretty much in depth on post-harvest. In pre-harvest considerations, it goes back to what crop are you going? What cultivar or varieties? What are the site characteristics as far as elevation, soils, water, uh, planting density on fruit crops, trellising and pruning, irrigation, fertilization, pest control, the whole ball of wax involved in growing good crops. The next thing we look at is when is the time to harvest these crops? And that's going to have a tremendous impact on our post-harvest operations. Most crops are harvested based on size and maturity. Um, some crops will have better quality and shelf life if they're picked slightly immature, while others are picked ready for consumption. We'll talk a little bit about that. 
if we pick too early, we're going to lose size. That's costing us money in some crops. We're also going to have poor quality. Sugars are going to be lower. The vitamin content will be lower. If we wait too long and pick late, we're going to have, in some cases, too much fiber in the produce, lower sugars, and we're going to see more pest problems with these over-mature crops. So it's important to, to realize that, that uh, the that harvest is very timely and we need to follow up on that. So optimum harvest actually depends on the intended use of the crop. In fruits, a general rule that we use is that the fruit will be stored for, uh, that's being stored for later use is picked earlier than those that are being consumed immediately. But you also have different types of, of uh, standards like uh, the example given here, if you're growing grapes and selling grapes, the intended use for the fruit will have an impact on when you harvest. Or, uh, when you, if you're using grapes for juice or jam, jelly, sparkling wines or still wines, we're going to look at different harvest times for those different uses. So we want to pick the, the crop at the optimum time for its intended use. We talk about maturity in, in regards to harvest, and maturity refers to the stage at which growth or development of that fruit or vegetable crop is optimum for a particular use. So to be mature, a crop must either be at the optimum point for consumption or processing, or able to reach that point once it's been pulled from the plant. So horticultural maturity is an important thing to look at. Uh, we harvest some crops physiologically immature, such as green cucumbers, green tomatoes, summer squash, gooseberries and cherries used for brining. Others are harvested firm, mature, but not ripe and are ripened later. And these include things like European pears, late apple varieties, etc. cetera. Uh, they can ripen if they are mature once they're removed from the plant. And then the final thing is we harvest some crops when they are ripe and ready for consumption. Berries, cherries, uh, slicing tomatoes, et cetera. Uh, the fruits and vegetables we, we sell at our roadside markets. Generally, we try to have them at a point where they're ready for uh, consumption at the time of sale. Ripening is described as the transformation of a physiologically mature fruit or vegetable from an unfavorable state of firmness, texture, color, flavor, and aroma to a more desirable state for consumption. So like we talked about earlier on, in some crops, ripening occurs before harvest. So when we pick it, it's ready for consumption immediately. And other crops, if the crop is mature, ripening may actually occur after it's removed from the plant. This slide shows several vegetables, those that are picked immature versus those that are picked mature, vine ripe. So you can see green peppers, cucumbers, summer squash, snap beans, et cetera, are picked at an immature state, whereas tomatoes, red peppers, muskmelon, cantaloupe, watermelon, are picked vine ripe and ready for immediate consumption. In the fruit world, uh, we find that apples, apricots, pears, peach, and plum will ripen if mature after they've been removed from the plant, whereas the small fruits and cherries and nut crops are not going to ripen any further once they're removed from the plant. If you're growing a root crop like carrots or beets or turnips, you can actually extend harvest time and, and not harvest that crop until you need them. Uh, they can be left in the ground through the winter if they're protected and recommend mulching them uh, so that they won't freeze. But you'll find that many of these crops, the cool temperatures over the winter will actually help improve the flavor. So you can stretch out harvest over a fairly long period of time with these root crops. It's important to be aware of, of, of several things in harvest, uh, in, in uh, many crops, especially in the fruits, 
you want to make sure that you harvest frequently. Don't let produce get overripe because you're going to have some rotting starts and that's going to uh, cause more loss. You're also going to introduce more insect and disease, uh, disease pressure. So harvest on a frequent basis and, and that you'll have less problems. Harvest in the early morning hours. Uh, the earlier you harvest, the cooler the crop is, the better off it's going to be as far as storage. But with that being said, you want to harvest when they're dry. If, if you harvest a crop when it's moist and it's wet, you're going to have issues with mold fairly quickly. Once that crop is harvested, keep it out of the sun. Keep it cool and uh, handle it carefully. Bruising actually will reduce the quality of the crop and reduce its storability. So that harvested crop needs to be handled carefully and moved to a cold storage as soon as possible. Don't mingle damaged produce with high quality produce. So regardless of what you're picking, uh, kind of a field grading uh, is gonna be important where you can separate damaged produce from the good sound stuff. Use clean and sanitized harvest bins and uh, don't handle the crop any more than necessary. So with some things we'll field pack and we'll talk about that in just a minute. The containers that you use uh, are uh, important too. In many cases, especially with the small fruits, we're trying to harvest directly into the container that the fruit's gonna be sold in. Uh, with that, you wanna have a relatively small container, a shallow container where you don't have a lot of layers of fruits because the, the bottom layers will have uh, be damaged by the weight on them. Uh, there are containers made of fiber, wood, and plastics out there. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages. Cost is, is one of the advantages on the first two. But on the uh, plastic containers, these are, are slitted and they've got a cover. They do allow for air movement. They're, they give you more protection uh, for the, uh, the fruit that's in them. Uh, so they may be your best choice, but realize that there are different types, but they need to be clean, they need to be sanitized, they need to be able to uh, not detract from that, uh, that quality of the fruit. If you field grade, and here we see a, a trailer load of peaches that uh, will be field graded, keep them in the shade uh, where they're not going to get hot because the heat is going to cause a lot of problems. It's also going to reduce the storability of that crop. With post-harvest handling, we're concerned with respiration, transpiration, temperature, and relative humidity. And we'll go through each of those steps and talk about what they are. <clears throat> fruits and vegetables are, trans are respiring. That is, uh, they're burning energy. So respiration is de defined as the process by which food reserves are oxidized to produce energy to keep the fruit or vegetable alive. And, and that's important. Remember, these fruits and vegetables are alive. Uh, higher rates of respiration results in deterioration of the, of the crop loss of nutrients, changes in texture, flavor, and weight loss. And respiration is not consistent among different crops. It varies by commodity. It varies by the conditions in which the, the uh, commodity is stored. Keep in mind, like we said, that these harvested produce are alive. Once harvested, the, the clock is ticking. You only have a certain amount of time before that produce becomes unmarketable. As a rule, the higher the respiration rate of a crop, the more perishable it is. And so if we look at this chart, nuts and dates are, are rated as having very low respiration rates and their perishability is fairly low. So they'll store for long periods of time, whereas as you move up the chain, asparagus, sweet corn, and pea in the vegetable world, and the cane berries, raspberries and blackberries, are uh, very perishable, and they also have very high respiration rates. So uh, it gives you, just knowing the type of crop that you're growing, it'll give you a little bit of an idea of what your storage potential might be. Transpiration is, uh, is uh, 
losing water to the environment. And remember that after you harvest, the conduit from the roots to the fruit or the vegetable is no longer there. So the plant can no longer get water uh, uptake. And the water loss by the crop, the harvested crop, will result in wilting or shriveling and softening of the produce, as well as loss of weight, crispness, juiciness, nutritional quality and favor, uh, flavor. So transpiration or water loss is something we try to control as much as possible once we pull that crop off the, the plant. Temperature is probably the most important factor in maintaining quality. And uh, we use uh, temperature control hopefully as a way to get field heat out of the crop and cool it down because that's going to extend the shelf life. As I mentioned, again, fruits and vegetables are alive. Heat increases water loss and respiration, reduces storage life and quality. <clears throat> Relative humidity is also a critical uh, aspect of storage. And we're looking at relative humidity as a measure of degree to which the air is saturated with water vapor. So the rate of water loss from a crop depends on the relative humidity difference between the intercellular structure within the crop and the surrounding air. It also is dependent somewhat on the surface characteristics of the produce. For most vegetable crops, we store at a high relative humidity, 85 to 95 percent. For fruit crops, we're looking generally 90 to 95 percent relative humidity in the storage. With this, we get longer shelf life, but it does come with a price. We can encourage disease problems as we get that uh, humidity level higher. Cool temperatures and sanitation can help limit that disease issue within the storage. And so by uh, putting uh, buckets of water or using humidifiers in our storages, we can increase relative humidity by proper storage loading and air circulation. We can lessen disease poten uh, potential. Field packing, I mentioned earlier, is actually where we're, we're picking the crop in the field into the container which the, the crop will be marketed in. So we're reducing the steps in the handling chain. By doing that, we reduce the damage for potential to the crop. And this is, this is used a lot in, in soft fruits like strawberries, uh, blackberries, raspberries. We do it a lot in peaches. Leafy crops uh, are, are often field packed. We wanna make sure that we keep the crop clean. And, and by doing that, we wanna reduce the contact of the container with the soil. You don't want to contaminate the crop in the container. And uh, here we're seeing small carts that are used in the field for strawberry harvest and also vegetables. Uh, not only is that easier for the, the pickers, but it also keeps that container up off the ground and gives you cleaner fruit and less potential problems uh, from contamination. Getting that crop from the plant to the storage as quickly as possible is important. Uh, depending on, on how big an operation you have, having uh, pop-up tents or, or stands where you shade the crop as a collection point and then use golf carts, hand carts, trailers, whatever, to get the material to storage in a timely manner is critical. Field heat is defined as the difference between the temperature of the harvested fruit or vegetable and the optimum storage temperature. The higher the field heat, the more perishable the product is going to be. So uh, field heat removal during the first few hours after harvest is essential to maintaining quality. In, in uh, the example shown here, an hour's delay in removal of field heat when the temperature is 95 degrees Fahrenheit will lower the shelf life of some of these crops by a day, even with optimal storage conditions. So getting that field heat out as fast as possible after harvest is a very important factor in uh, maintaining that crop quality. <coughs> We pre-cool crops, uh, that is 
we'll pre-cool them before we get them in cold storage uh, to get the field heat out faster. And so with pre, uh, the proper pre-cooling apparatus, uh, we'll see much quicker temperature reduction of the produce than just setting it in a cold room. Forced air is used a lot in fruits. Uh, and this just involves rapid movement of cool, moist air over the crop, uh, and uh, it will lower uh, the temperatures quickly. Post-harvest losses may run 25 to 30 percent without pre-cooling, and we can reduce it substantially. Here we're saying 5 to 10 percent with pre-cooling. So uh, it's an important factor to consider in maintaining crop quality. Several different things are used in pre-cooling crops. It depends on the type of crop. Room cooling, where you have an insulated room equipped with refrigeration and good air movement is one way. The forced air cooling that I just mentioned, where we use fans to pull cool air through packages of produce. Hydrocooling, that is showering the produce with chilled water. Now this is, is effective, but it's not suitable for all vegetable crops. Top or liquid icing, putting crushed ice on top of the produce uh, is used a lot for some produce like sweet corn or broccoli. And then vacuum cleaning, uh, cooling, where we uh, produce is cooled in a vacuum that forces water to evaporate. And this, the evaporation process, will help remove heat. Used for leafy crops a lot. This slide shows that the, uh, it points out that different pre-cooling methods are used for different crops. And, and so as you look down through from endive to lettuce to onions, and you'll see that endive is vacuum cooled a lot. Lettuce is, is either uh, water cooled or, or vacuum cooled, whereas onions, we use air uh, to, to uh, pre-cool that crop. Not one method is satisfactory for everything. Room cooling, uh, and, and this is, is one that, that works quite well for some crops. Uh, you want to have a room that's large enough to handle the crops, the harvest, so that you don't have uh, produce that's left out. You can uh, build your own or, or buy uh, ready-made units. And uh, this just shows a couple of, uh, well, a pre-cooling room and a cool bot used to maintain temperatures in that room. Not I mentioned not all uh, crops can be used uh, or any one cooling or pre-cooling technique for all crops. Some vegetables are best stored at 45 to 55 degrees, and some of them are subject to chilling injury. So we're looking at the time of cooling and the uh, temperatures to uh, examine or to predict the potential for chilling. Highly sensitive crops like basil, cucumbers, eggplant, pumpkins, et cetera, uh, are sensitive to chilling, whereas others like snap beans, muskmelons, peppers are more tolerant of chilling and not as apt to be damaged. So when we talk about chilling injury symptoms, uh, you can see the green beans on the upper right-hand slide. Uh, they're pitting or blemished because of the cold. We also see discoloration of the fruit. The cucumbers, uh, you can see the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the wrinkling of the skin, uh, the, the damage done by chilling. And we can also interfere with the ability of that crop to ripen and make it more susceptible to decay by using the wrong method to pre-cool. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, this slide shows crops that can be iced on the left versus those that will be damaged by direct contact with ice on the right. So it's important to realize that you may have to use different types of, of pre-cooling techniques depending on the crops that you want to maintain. As I mentioned earlier, temperature is the easiest and most effective way to modify storage life. And uh, as a rule uh, in fruits, we'll say a 10, degree Fahrenheit reduction in temperature of the fruit will reduce the respiration rate by about 50%. So you can extend storage life even with modest temperature reduction. 
at 77 degrees Fahrenheit and 30% relative humidity, fruit loses water about 30 times, 35 times faster than at 32 degrees and 90% relative humidity. So you can see that the with proper storage, pre-cooling and storage, we can extend that marketability of the crop many times. And this carries over all the way through the, the chain uh, from harvest to actually getting to the final uh, sales point. Chippers report that storing at 40 degrees Fahrenheit reduces the shelf life by about 50% compared to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Storage temperatures vary depending on crops. I mentioned that earlier. Again, on vegetables, you can see that there are many that store best at about 32 degrees where you've got others that need to be at higher temperatures. Uh, make sure that, that you uh, have the right conditions for the crops you're growing. In small fruits, uh, most of our fruits store best at about 31 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 90 to 95 uh, percent relative humidity. But realize that even with these optimum conditions, there's a big difference in how long you're going to keep fruit, depending on the type of fruit it is. Notice that, that uh, blueberries we can store for two to four weeks, whereas when we get down to something like uh, the uh, king berries, we're looking at two or three days max. So the crop has uh, uh, different levels of tolerance as far as maintaining shelf life. We're going to uh, store. It's better to keep the crop at a constant temperature and humidity level. And so with that being said, if you've got a fair amount of produce that you're moving through, it would be better to have two smaller storage rooms than one large one so that you could load a room, close it up, seal it, and maintain that constant temperature humidity level. Whereas the other room that you're filling, there's not as good a temperature humidity control while you're run, opening that door and taking produce in. Uh, having smaller rooms where you can seal them up will give you better overall uh, uh, shelf life of your produce. In those rooms, you need to have good air circulation and good exchange. And also when we load the room, we need to make sure that we set the, the uh, produce in there in ways that will allow good air movement down uh, between the rows and possibly underneath by having them up on pallets and over the top. We need to also look at ethylene. Uh, ethylene is a, a naturally occurring ripening hormone in some of our produce. It promotes ripening. And as we ripen a crop, we also increase its susceptibility to disease. Uh, damaged and diseased crops, I might point out, produce higher levels of ethylene than healthy intact, uh, intact produce. So bruising, for example, uh, if you bruise an apple, it's going to generate more ethylene at that bruise site than it would if it was a, a, a sound fruit. Want to be sure when you store produce that you don't store ethylene producing fruits and vegetables with ethylene sensitive crop. Uh, that's again, a critical thing that, that uh, could have a direct impact on how long you could store something. Several different crops that produce ethylene are listed here, ranging from apples, apricots, on down to uh, plums, quinces, and tomatoes. Again, these, as they ripen, produce ethylene. Uh, on the other hand, we've got ethylene-sensitive crops listed in this slide. Asparagus, snap beans, broccoli, and so on are all sensitive to ethylene. You definitely would not want to put any of these crops in with an ethylene producing type of crop because it would uh, it would have a tremendous impact on the shelf life of these ethylene sensitive crops. Question always comes up about washing. Should you wash produce or not? In many cases for vegetables, it's essential. Uh, if you do that, you need to have a plentiful source of clean water that's changed often. You may have to brush the crop 
uh, especially root crops because they, they have high soil loads. Uh, leafy greens, uh, you would like to drain them thoroughly if they are washed before you bag and store them. Better yet, avoid having to wash them if you can. Don't wash damaged or diseased produce. It'll contaminate the wash water uh, and those produce are not gonna store very long anyhow. And the water that you use should have a sanitizer, should be checked on a regular basis. In fruits, uh, generally try to discourage washing between harvest and storage. And the reason for that is putting a warm fruit into cold or wash water can actually cause infusion of certain contaminates into the fruit. In addition to that, we can remove the protective cuticle on the surface of fruit, which means we'll have more moisture loss in storage. And we're also gonna have less resistance to rots becoming established. So we come from, we take the fruit out of the field, put it in storage, and then we'll wash it as we're grading it and getting it ready to ship to the market. If you've got a, a picking scar like we see on a tomato, uh, that's an entry point for bacteria. And with improper handling or wash water management, we can actually cause problems. Uh, with, uh, the rule that we try to follow is that the fruit pulp must be a, no less than, well, it must be less than 10 degrees warmer than the water temperature to prevent infusion of the water and contaminants into that fruit. Okay. Um, there are several crops that we don't want to wash before market, berries, spinach, unless it's really dirty, basil, summer squash are just examples of those. It's very difficult to wash some crops and get it actually clean. How long will a crop last uh, in storage? And, and this chart gives us an idea. Uh, if you hit store apples, depending on the variety, you could actually keep them from about one month for some of the earlier season varieties, up to 12 months in common storage uh, for a late fall apple. So it varies a lot depending on the crop, but realize that you can extend the storage life or the shelf life of that fruit a lot by ideal storage conditions. Something else that I hadn't mentioned before, um, we talked about storing, uh, not storing ethylene generating crops with ethylene sensitive crops, but also some crops should not be stored with others simply because of cross contamination with odors. Apples uh, or pears, shouldn't be stored, for example, with celery, cabbage, potatoes, carrots, or onions because they'll pick up an off flavor. Uh, likewise, apple orders from apples and pears are readily picked up by meat, eggs, and dairy products. So you, you don't want to uh, store crops together and come out with a, a very unmarketable result. Another post-harvest uh, operation is curing for certain crops. Curing thickens the skin, which reduces moisture loss and provides better protection against insects and microbes. So if you're growing our, uh, onions and garlic, you leave the roots attached, keep the crop out of the sun and rain in a well-ventilated area, cure it for a couple of weeks at 80 to 90 degree Fahrenheit, at which time the tops can be cut off after curing uh, and, and they'll, they'll uh, last a, a lot longer than if they're not properly cured. Potatoes and sweet potatoes, also we look at curing the crop uh, under spe uh, specific conditions. Potatoes, five to 10 days at 59 to 68 degrees in high humidity. Uh, all of that just to make sure that we've got a good quality crop to put on the market over an extended period. Once we are moving the crop to market, we want to maintain proper quality conditions. Uh, <clears throat> we want that uh, crop to get to market in as good a shape as possible. And the Food Modernization Safety Act actually focuses on food safety while transporting produce, but many of the requirements under them focus also on keeping the quality there. So you want to have 
clean vehicles that uh, are not going to result in contamination of the crop. You want to have temperature control during transportation. The drivers, the people that handle the produce must be properly trained so that they know what to do uh, to keep that crop in good shape. And of course, documentation is going to help in case problems should arise. Once you get to the destination, again, it's important to avoid rough handling of the produce to minimize uh, bruising and have as few as steps uh, that that produce will be handled before it gets to the, the sales point. Keep it cool, keep it at the right temperature, and it may be necessary to sort that produce. And the, the uh, grocery or the market should be looking at that crop as they're putting it out on the shelves and removing any uh, defective or bruised or, or uh, rotted material before it gets on the shelf. We have a problem uh, in many of our outdoor markets because we don't have the ability to control temperatures uh, and humidity or have the air circulation that we'd like in some of our indoor sites. So it's important to do whatever we can to keep that produce cool, keep it in good shape. Therefore, we want to choose the location of our market, whether it's indoor or outdoor, carefully. Just a, a few tips on, on working with produce. Uh, sharp tools make a clean cut, and this helps prevent water loss. Harvesting early in the day to avoid field heat buildup and, and getting that produce out of the field and into storage as soon as possible is critical. Handle the produce as little as possible. Cooling is a very, very effective way to increase shelf life. Don't wash unless you have to. And keep ethylene producers away from sensitive crops. Now, these are just some of the resources that were used in putting this presentation together. Uh, and there is a lot of good information out there on how to handle produce from the field to the consumer. And with that, thank you very much. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, hopefully we can address some of those at this time. So Rachel, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. We don't have any questions yet, but everyone that's listening, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A for Dr. Lockwood. Question. Will a crop be damaged once cooled and then brought to market on table in a heat? Yeah, it, it can be. I mean, it would, one, again, uh, what you'll see when it warms up is the respiration rate is going to start going back up and it's going to start, it'll deteriorate at a much faster rate than it would have had it been con kept continuously cool. So yeah, if we the longer we can maintain that cool, uh, moist environment, the better off we're going to be all the way through the chain. Great. What are your tips for strawberry harvest? Well, again, uh, for strawberry harvest, we want to uh, we want to pick frequently so that we don't have any overripes in the field. And I might point out too, it, it uh, when when picking, if you if you come across a berry that's rotted or something like that, the ideal scenario would be to get it out of the field. Now, uh, and to pick your own, that's going to be difficult to do. But if you're having uh, your crop harvested uh, by yourself or you have employees, uh, they may be able to separate the defective fruit and and uh, get it out of the field to lessen the the problems that you'll have uh, with the intact of the healthy fruit. But pick frequently, get that ripened fruit in the shade, get it into a, a cool environment as quickly as can. Uh, when you pick a strawberry, ideally we want to pick it with the cap on uh, and a short section of the stem because that uh, if you take the cap off, the berry is going to lose moisture at a much greater rate than it would uh, with the cap intact. It also is an entry point for uh, disease organisms. So pick it with the cap on, pick in the shallow containers. Don't, uh, don't have a deep bucket where you're going to put the fruit in because the weight of the fruit is going to be, uh, will be damaging the fruit on the bottom of the container. Uh, and handle it gently. 
because it's, you don't want to bruise that crop. Perfect. So we do have a follow-up question on the strawberries. How long can strawberries be stored for? I plan on going to a market on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Should I be harvesting on Tuesdays and Fridays, or would they hold for both markets? The best way to handle it would be to harvest as close to possible for each market. So it would be separate harvest. Uh, it would be, uh, there's going to, if you pick before the first market and tried to hold for the second market, you're going to see less quality fruit uh, for that latter market. The more frequent harvest is going to give you better fruit to put on the market. Perfect. Okay, next, what are pumpkins most similar to for this presentation? So I guess they're talking about um, harvesting, harvesting if it you know, will continue to become ripen after you pick. Um, I'm not sure what they're referring to, but they're just asking what are pumpkins most similar to for this presentation? Well, they would be similar to some of the, the uh, later squashes, uh, uh, but uh, they're... Uh, a pumpkin is, is again, you want to harvest it with the stem and, and uh, be careful, uh, but they're going to last a good while. They're not like a summer squash, but they they uh, they can last a good while, but they also uh, would benefit from cooler temperatures, although a lot of times we don't see that. Uh, but I would look at them as, as being similar to some of the squash. Next one. Why do my strawberries appear larger the day before market and then smaller the next day? They are in a cooler. That is from Deborah Lockard from Lockard's Farm. Okay. And, and well, um, they're losing moisture even in a cooler. And, and so that, that would be, I guess, my, my first thought. Uh, and the humidity, the relative humidity in the cooler, going to have an impact on and the and the uh, temperatures in that cooler will both have an impact on how much actual moisture they lose but uh that would be uh, it's to me that's got to be the answer is moisture loss and uh we can minimize it through storage conditions uh but we're not going to eliminate it entirely okay next question here is any tips on an elderberry harvest and being presented at harvest. Okay, with elderberry harvest, uh, of course, you, you want to um, harvest that fruit cluster. Again, elderberries are not going to last very long. They're, they're more uh, tolerant uh, than, say, a, a raspberry, blackberry, but they're a relatively short shelf life crop. So uh, harvest them, cool them down, keep them moist, that's about the, uh, and handle them gently. That's about the best thing you can do. And and sell the whole, uh, well, I, I don't know what flower head, I guess I'd say, mm -hmm. and don't, don't try to remove individual berries and do that just before use because they, they'll keep better that way. Uh, and also it's very difficult to take those berries off and not damage them. One way to do it is to freeze them and take them off while they're frozen. But uh, but still, I'd, I'd sell that whole head of elderberry rather than try to sell berries that have been picked off. Is it better to have some berries not ripe on the flower head and then the rest ripe for your elderberries? So I follow up on that one. They're no, they're pretty much going to ripen. Uh, okay. on the plant. Once you pull them, I don't think you see much of any additional ripening. No. So while we wait on any other questions to come through, I will share about some uh, specialty fruit crop workshops that we are going to host in March. So these uh, released recently. I will try to share my screen here and show you all. So you can register for these now. These are open. Dr. Lockwood and I will both be presenting at these workshops in March. They will be hosted in each region of the state. So March 2nd at the Northeast Tennessee Ag Research Center in Greenville, March 6th at MTREC in Spring Hill, and March 9th in Bolivar in West Tennessee and Falcon Ridge Farm. 
So we will talk about uh, production and marketing. This is primarily, again, for commercial producers. Backyard producers are welcome to attend as well, um, but this is going to be geared towards commercial producers. We'll kind of focus on blueberries, elderberries, and persimmons. Um, we will kind of answer questions about other specialty fruit crops, though. And again, Dr. Lockwood will be there, Dr. Natalie Bumgarner um, with Plant Sciences as well from UT. And then um, I will be speaking about marketing. We also have some budgeting tools for blueberries. We have some budgets that have been released from Dr. Mar Margarita Valandia from the Department of Ag and Resource Economics. These are free to attend. Um, but we do need you to register. So you can go to tiny.utk.edu slash fruit2023. So again, tiny.utk.edu slash fruit2023 to get registered. And that's just going to pull up a, a Google form to register. You'll choose the location that you want to attend and um, just complete that registration form. If you have any questions about how to get registered, you can email me. Uh, but again, this fruit workshop in March coming up, uh, we also have some vegetable ones in March that will be coming up about garlic and microgreens with Dr. Annette Wazlocki, and those should be released in the next couple of weeks. So again, be on the lookout for those as well. Any tips for getting the most out of the Pick Tennessee conference coming up? Dr. Lockwood has way more experience going to Pick Tennessee than I do, but I would say uh, my tip, and then I'll let you share yours as well, is go ahead and start looking at the schedule and finding the sessions that you want to attend because there's a ton of different sessions going on at the same time and it can be overwhelming to try to find the one that you want to attend and find that room if you've never been before. So um, go ahead and start looking at the schedule. It has been released already. And I would say um, if you are going with a friend or you know someone else from your same operation, split up. Um, so don't go and sit in the same sessions, uh, go and look at the schedule again and decide who's going where, and then take notes and share those notes after the sessions each day. Because again, you will forget what you learned if you don't share it with someone. So again, start looking at the schedule now, find the sessions you want to attend and split up. Yeah, and along with that, I'd say if uh, try to get uh, to the sessions a little bit ahead of time because some of them fill up and uh, we might have end up with standing room only or, or not even that. So get there early. Uh, I like the idea of having going with a friend or a family member and, and assigning different topics for different people. Uh, but make sure also that you, you keep out plenty of time to attend the trade show too, because uh, there's, there's a lot to be learned, a lot to be seen. A lot of valuable context being made there. Yes, agreed. And the networking events. Um, so each night, Thursday night and Friday night, they will have um, Tennessee Farm Wine Growers Alliance and the Tennessee Craft Brewers Guild will host um, some networking events those evenings, along with some of our meat associations. And um, so I would definitely attend those because, again, you can learn from each other. So. Um, attend those network. The speakers a lot of the time will be there as well. So go and ask them questions and utilize all of that time. So I guess my my number one thing, like Dr. Lockwood said, is utilize every single second um, that you were there. Attend all the sessions and get there early. The cut flower sessions will be on Saturday. And last year we were in a room that held 35 and we had 70 people in there. If that helps you um, know what he means by get there early. So again, we had people sitting on the floor, standing in the back, the door was open so people could stand outside and listen. So definitely get to the sessions early, find a seat, sit down, um, you know, and go ahead and claim your seat. So yes, get to the sessions early, split up if you can. Um, and again, start looking at that schedule now so you can find out what you might want to go to. All right. Last question here, probably. How do you recommend to keep birds away from elderberries before harvest? Netting is going to be the only truly effective way. Uh, and, and the net ideally should be suspended above the plant. Don't lay it on top of the plant because the birds will pick through the netting and, and uh, damage the berries. Get them on early. Don't let the birds establish a feeding pattern before you try to keep them off. It'll be much more difficult if they are 
uh, if they know there's there's a food source there for them. And uh, you, while you need to cover the top, you also need to take that net to the ground or at least to the base of the plant and secure it so they can't come up underneath the net and up into the, the plant. Uh, it's, it's very difficult and exclusion or netting is really the only truly effective way of, of getting any kind of protection. And that would, you know, go for any fruit crop, really. Yes. Okay, next question. Will any of the Pick Tennessee sessions be recorded if we cannot attend? I do not believe so. Um, the Pick Tennessee conference is mostly geared towards in-person attendance. Um, we do have a lot of sessions of other educational sessions recorded on um, different UTIA YouTube channels. So if you are looking for more educational sessions, again, you can visit utihort.com um, and they have resources and videos on that website, utihort.com. You can also go to the UT Hort YouTube channel and watch sessions there. We also have the Center for Profitable Agriculture YouTube channel as well. Uh, where these sessions are recorded and placed, but there's others there as well that you can go and watch. Um, but no, I don't think that the Pick Tennessee sessions are recorded at all. If you're not familiar with our field days, again, you can look up our research stations across the state. We have 10 research stations across the state of Tennessee, and we host field days there with our research staff and extension faculty staff as well um, teaching those. So you know, one of those is the fruits of the backyard. I'm sure you might be at that one. Are there others that you can think of? The uh, steak and potatoes at Crossville. Uh, we do, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's every other year or every year now, the organic uh, field day at Knoxville. Uh, there's several. And of course, you have the fall garden festival and then the uh, fall celebrations and uh, on the stations as well. We did have a couple questions here. How do you recommend combating squash bugs, companion planting, or anything that they can do for squash bugs? Well, companion planting uh, may help some, but it's going to be very difficult uh, to eliminate them. Uh, I would, um, the, uh, well, I'd have to do some looking to see what's out there and recommendations for control, but uh, I, Without looking at the guides, I, I couldn't tell you that. Okay. So the other question was, will you send out documentation to certify attendance? Yes. So after the April 1st deadline for everyone to watch these, then I will send out a um, notification. If you have watched five of the six and you are eligible for one of the special education requirements, for TAEP. If you have not completed five of the six, then you will also get an email saying that you will need to continue watching the sessions um, ahead of time. So again, I'll kind of send out a warning email letting people know before the April 1st deadline, you need to continue watching some videos in order to get that educational requirement. Um, and then if you have watched five of the six, then you will be notified that you are eligible uh, for that special requirement from TAEP, that will be sent directly to TDA. So um, again, they will have that on file. If you have any questions, though, you're welcome to email me. I guess that concludes our session today. Thank you, Dr. Lockwood, for speaking with us and sharing about post-harvest handling. If you have any questions about that, you can reach out to him. Um, and he his email will be in the follow-up email that you will receive soon with this recording. Uh, you can also reach out to Dr. Annette Wislocki, our commercial vegetable specialist, if you have questions about vegetables. And thank you so much for joining us for the final session of the Tennessee Farmers Market Vendor Boot Camp. If you have any questions throughout the year, feel free to contact us. Feel free to join us at our upcoming sessions and educational programs. And we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Mm -hmm.